hockey. Yeah. yeah. My favorite. It's Judd's Hockey Show. And it is Judd's Hockey Show on uh, the Wednesday Extravaganza. That means it's Judd. It's Jesse Pierce, Bar Down Beauties, NHL.com, wild reporter extraordinaire. AJ Fredrickson joins us. If you're wondering where Declan is, he's doing a lot more twins work because he's doing twin shows now. Jesse, don't, don't, mm-hmm. uh, don't shake your head. He's watching the twins are playing the Brewers right now in Milwaukee. So he told me he had to watch that. So AJ sitting in will do a fantastic job. He's on the show all the time. Someday Dex will come back to us. I don't know when. <laughs> uh, before we start, though, uh, I do, I do want to give a shout out to our new partner, Nicolay Law. Nicolay Law knows that when you or a loved one gets injured, ordinary life can come to a sudden halt and things can get complicated. During that time, insurance companies are likely to pressure you. They don't care if you get better. They don't care if your medical bills are piling up. They don't care that you may not be able to work, but Nicolay Law, guess what? Russell and his crew, they definitely do. They've seen every play the insurance companies have in their playbook. They'll drop the gloves, get it, to make sure you get the compensation you deserve after an accident. So if you've been injured, get Minnesota's local award-winning injury lawyers. Get Nicolay. Start your path to winning at NicolayLaw.com. That's Nicolay, N-I-C-O-L-E-T, law.com. Give them a call, 1-855-NICOLAY, 1-855-N-I-C-O-L-E-T. All right, plenty to get to. Um, I want to start off with this. So uh, Jesse and I were at the game last night against the Senators, a 3-2, a narrow escape by the Wild against the Senators team that's not good, but actually won five consecutive games coming in. Uh, Jess, I want to start you off with the post-game press conference, which I thought took an interesting t- – well, it didn't take an interesting tone. John Hines' tone never changes. It took – his words did, though, I thought. Um, so the Wild blows a two-rip lead. Ottawa ties it at two. There is a shorthanded breakaway on which Mark Andre Fleury makes a very nice save. He had a great game again, or a great game. And then the Wild shortly thereafter comes back. Vinny Letary scores to make it 3 2. So I feel like a month ago, I feel like three weeks ago, you know, if John Hines was asked about that win, and you might have asked the question, but John Hines would go out of his way to talk about, yeah, they came back, and there, there would be no, there would be nothing subtle, like no subtle jab, no subtle. Uh, criticism he said i think we scored the goal but i think our game in general needs to be tightened up in a lot of areas going into thursday's game against colorado his tone to me had changed uh or his words had changed into saying this is a work in progress and yeah we won but we didn't play nearly as tight as we had to i just i felt for a long time i think when the playoff hopes were more alive the john hines jess was definitely trying to convey an optimism. What are your thoughts on the fact that now it feels like he's conveying a reality of what's going to have to change here, especially next season? I mean, I think for him, he's reached a frustration level, right? He's come in and done a lot of really good things. I don't think we've ever negated how John Hines has kind of turned this team around and bought, had them buy into a better belief system than they were currently buying under Dean Ebsen. Um, the tone was definitely there, and I think it's got to be frustrating from the perspective of, each post game, he's always mentioned the details. He hasn't been happy with the details of the team. They've messed up and made these little mistakes, and he really needs them to clean them up. They haven't done that. They're still missing those finer details of their game. And at this point in the season, you should have had those worked out, kinked out. I mean, yes, you've had guys come and go, but for the most part, the lineup's been fairly healthy as of late, aside from Marcus Felino, naturally. Um, you know, I think that's where his frustration, because he keeps saying it over. I could go back through transcripts throughout the season, and that's been his main point that he's been trying to drive home. So I think that comes from a point of frustration, a point of contention too, uh, because reality is even if you win the next couple games, get the two points, don't allow for overtime points, you're still not going to be there. You're still going to need L.A. Unless L.A. loses every game from here on out, and so does St. Louis, you just you don't have a chance. The runway is too short, and that's no surprise, and I think no surprise to John Hines. So it is. It's trying to figure out, okay, what's working, what's not, because as we've discussed on this very show, Bill Guerin has some things to think about come this offseason as far as some of the players that he has under contract, some of the new kids coming in, and what that looks like, and I think that's the fair point that they need to be looking at right now is, okay, how do we get through these next games, be competitive, push it out there but work on your game work on the finer details because that's what a good team does when they're out of the playoffs Aid, your thoughts on that yeah no it, it, she's exactly right um like jesse said the finer details of this team are in a lot of the stuff that's been pointed out here too uh to john hines which he's addressed is like 
For instance, last night, I had zero faith going into the third period that that team was going to be able to hold on to the lead. They needed another goal, you know, and lo and behold, they did. So um, it, it's it's stuff like just the home stretch of a game, being able to a lesser opponent, being able to just push them away and pe- like clear that path to getting one or two goals to uh, to ice it rather than waiting for like a Ryan Hartman 200 foot Hail Mary in the last final seconds on an empty netter to really ice a game, getting it done in the first five or 10 minutes of that third period. And then you can kind of shift your tactics so that you're not desperate down the stretch. You, you have that two goal lead, a little bit of cushion. So you can, if you need to make uh, make some sort of mistake in the final five minutes that it doesn't cost you. Now you're playing an extra session and you have to consider at this point of the year, pulling your goaltender in overtime, getting the finer details of just ironing out the game here, moving forward is, I mean, that, that's what they have to do. It's, it's it's looking and assessing what you can change and improve on heading into the offseason, into training camp, into season opener of 2025. Jesse, how much of this team do you think, and and yeah, there, there's con, there's contractual issues, there's certainly uh, uh, things that could stop guys from being traded or moved, but how much of this team do you think is prepared, just as a rough estimate, is prepared to play how Hines wants because like he got the job, he stepped in. It was Dean's team. Like like this is not his team yet. Like it's I, I, his systems are installed to a certain degree, but my guess is they're not training camp installed. So like when you watch this team, how much do you think this team is prepared to do what what you talked about, which and Heinz has talked about, which is really execute the details of what he wants. I'd say you're about 50-50, and I look at it as the younger guys are the ones that are going to obviously buy into that, not only because many of them didn't have the amount of time under Dean Evson, but that's kind of the style that they've come up playing. I think that's what John Hines can really do. He has experience at the NTDP. He has that experience coaching some of those younger players and helping get the best out of them, and I think those younger players are some of the ones that are still open to refining their game. You've got guys like Marcus Johansson and Freddie Goudreau who have been in the league for an amount of time now, and they might kind of be, you don't want to say one trick pony, but they're not ready to really go back and reevaluate. And certainly the best players were. Kirill Kaprizov is always going to go back and evaluate his game, right? I mean, you've got right. guys like that that are always going to be open to it that have a veteran status amongst the league. But I think it's about 50-50 right now. And I don't think it's a crazy thing that John Hines is asking any of them to do either. And this is just my perception from the outside looking in. I could be completely wrong on that predication of 50-50. But that's just kind of the sense I get because you do. You have some guys that are set in their ways and it's been successful for them to have a the longevity of an NHL career that they might have had up until this point, but it might be asking too much from from Heinz. So again, I think that's another fair conversation you have come this offseason of, okay, what do we have here? Because you want to be going from the get-go, day one of training camp with the players that are going to be ready to mold into what John Heinz needs. And that's what makes this entire discussion so, discussion so intriguing to me too, because if, if we get to the contract brothers, Felino, Zuccarello, and Hartman, you know, th- those guys were locked in. You didn't have to like it at the time, but it's like, okay, they did that. I don't understand why they did all three, but they're Dean's players. Dean likes them. Well, heck, let's go back to last spring a year ago, and Goudreau gets locked in for what? It's a cheap contract, but it's five years a term. And now it's like, do, do all of those guys fit in? I want to talk about one of those guys in particular because I felt like from – uh, watching him standpoint of late, there's been a real drop off, and statistically, it's proven correctly. Matt Zuccarello had two goals and ten points in a four game span from Feb 19 to the 24th, so he was red hot. Since then, he's played 15 games, including last night. He has no goals, six assists. Next season, he starts a two year, 8.25 million dollar extension that includes a no move clause. Am I alone in thinking that Zuccarello, I mean, he might just be slumping, but he's certainly not young. And and I think a lot of what I just went through statistically is since he got taken off the Kaprizov line, which is always going to help you. How much more do we think Zuccarello has to offer at his age and assuming that Boldy is now going to be the other winger for the most part, aside from power play time with Kirill? I mean, I I look at it as you'd mentioned getting removed from Kaprizov's line. If, 
I'm going to go hard and heavy on this. It's because Marcus Johansson is on his line and he can't help create anything. I mean, you have a guy like that that kind of bogs down. I like Matt Zuccarello, Marco Rossi. And I think Matt Zuccarello, to start the year especially, was one of the most consistent guys. He was making plays happen. He was doing some really, really good things. And I don't think we recognize that. Um, For whatever reason, Minnesota has certainly gotten their juices squeeze out of Matt Zuccarello in the later years of life. But also to that point, I was okay if they were looking at shopping him. If the New York Rangers had come calling and Zuki said, yep, I'd go. Sure, because he is on that latter end. I'd still give him a, you know another good look next year and see what could happen and remove Marcus Johansson from the equation and see if that helps. Because I do, and you could do that before the season's out, certainly. But I just see that JoJo's bogging that line down a little bit. There's not a lot going. He doesn't shoot. He doesn't skill. He doesn't I, he set skates. up the place. He doesn't. He skate. skates around really nice on the. Perimeter. Sometimes not even that. You yeah, know what I mean? Like true. I think that's the problem. Is Zuki's probably a little frustrated and and again, Matt Zuccarello has had some very bad games as of late himself. No matter who he was playing with, right. but yeah, I think that's one thing that you look at moving or changing before looking at uh, tossing Zuki to the side. What do you think, Gage? Would it be crazy, and I mean, to address that before the end of the season, just to see what you have there? By mm-hmm. when I look at it, Matt Zuccarello, he's bitten way too heavily by the pass bug. This guy loves to pass. He he dreams about it. That's he goes to bed, pass, pass, pass. Yeah. He dreams of assists. Yeah. So to me, the counterpoint there is get a guy who wants to shoot. And right now, that's not Marcus Johansson. To Jesse's point, he doesn't do a whole lot other than like Judd said, skate up and down the ice around the perimeter. That's cute. It's awesome. Fantastic. Just swap those the, those right now. I'm looking at uh, the wild line combination. Just move the uh, second and third line left wings. Put Adam mm-hmm. Beckman yeah. paired. That's a guy who sure. really hasn't, and I, you know, the, the running joke is like he needs to get his chance. There's that chance. Give him a second line spot. Has he earned it? That's, uh, you know, awfully debatable. But what he hasn't uh, need to prove yet is that he loves to shoot. We Everybody knows that. This guy was lighting up in the AHL. He shot happy. This is a guy that I think Matt Zuccarello would probably thrive with because he loves feeding and dishing. He's the chef at a cafeteria. Well, guess what? Adam Beckman's got an appetite. So if you give him the puck, he's going to put it on net. Even if it's a low percentage, shot, 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 that's what's going to happen. I mean, call him Little John because he's he's going to be drunk in the club. <laughs> so That went right over my head. So brilliant, it seems like I you, love it. It seems like you two knew exactly what it was about, so I'm going to pretend I did too. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, what what what's stopping this team? Because we right now – you have less than a 5% chance. To me, that's a 0% chance of making the playoffs. So let's have fun. Let's ex- let's experiment. Let's see what we have. Let's take stock. Frankly, I've seen more than enough of Marcus Johansson in a top six role. So let's get Adam Beckman up there, get him some minutes. This is a guy that likes to shoot. So let's see if he's a guy that moving forward can be a shot uh, a shot theft in your offensive uh, you know plans in the future that can actually find the back of the net. It's one thing to shoot because we see Zach Bogosian do it from the blue line often. I don't like all of his shot selections, but frankly, he does like to shoot, so I'll give him credit. Adam Beckman is going to do that as a young guy up front who probably can find the back of the net and benefit you in the long run. And then what's the difference between him and Johansson? He's going to create depth that you haven't seen from this season. That top line is great. We saw the stat um, before the broadcast last night that they're one of the best in the league when it comes to per 60 goals uh, per average. They don't have anybody else. Adam Beckman can at least help to, like, that background stage presence. Get him up on that second line with uh, with Rossi and Zuccarello, and let's see if that can re- reignite a guy like Matt Zuccarello who's known to be a very good playmaker. When it comes to Johansson, since uh, Jesse broached this, I don't see anything he does that I want in my lineup. Like, okay, you put him on the third line. He's still going to pull the same crap. And on the fourth line, I need guys that work hard. Um, like, like, I don't know that there's a good fit. Like, I don't really know why he's still playing. He doesn't give them the best chance to win. Zuccarello, what I'm curious about is if you remove Kaprizov and, and, you know, that line, that top line has for the most part played really well. Uh, if you remove Kaprizov from Zuccarello and to AJ's point, you know, Matt thinks he's Gretzky in Gretzky's prime as far as passing goes, um, (laughs) is, is he still an effective player. Now, the problem is he starts a two-year extension. It's a no move. You would literally have to go to him this summer and say, would, would you accept a trade? And that's assuming I found a buyer at that contract price. But I just, I was watching him again last night and I just have a lot of questions. Now, if you could get another guy that could score some goals on that wing, Jesse, you're probably right. I mean, 
Beckman makes sense to at least give a chance to. I guess the question is, can you bring in a scorer with Zuccarello? But then Rossi's the center. Yeah, Matz is a weird... He's a weird fit right, right now, I think. Mm -hmm. Because he's a winger who wants to play like a center. But then, like you said, if you don't have another sharp shooter wing... I mean, is Rossi supposed to turn into more of a shooter himself then? Like, like what's that line supposed to look like? If I did get a winger who would who would actually compete and not take games off. Uh, what does that do then to Rossi's role, do we think? I mean, I like any opportunity you have to elevate Rossi's role, and I think he's a hungry kid. I know Minnesota currently the only two, or the only team with two players uh, in conversation for the caller, which you love in Rossi and, and Faber, and I think he's really shown people what he can do. I think he's very capable of shooting. He's kind of been snake bitten, and not for lack of trying, though, right? Like, it's right. just kind of been, it's been tough to watch because you know he's out there and he's putting the shots on net, and it's just not breaking through for him. I mean, Ryan Hartman comes back from suspension. He can certainly go in there. He's not terrible either in that role, I think. He's he's somebody that can bury the puck or minimally get that net front presence. But then, yeah, maybe Rossi turns into more your skilled scorer on that line, and I think that would be okay. I don't really – I've never been super hung up on, especially when there are players that are so interchangeable between center and wing like the Wild have. Like, yes, we need a number one center for Minnesota. I get that. I'm not negating that point. But I do love having guys that are versatile and can play both ways I think that's the new era of the NHL a little bit too. You know, you've got one or two really hard no centers and the rest of them can kind of swap around. So I think Marco could certainly elevate his role. I'd love to see that because we stand Marco Rossi. I don't know who said that we oh, should I... trade him last year. I would have never well, there, done such a thing. There's now and... a faction who thinks he's going to be <laughs> traded this summer. I, I've, I've yeah, been seeing no. tweets about that. That and, and it's from it's from some credible folks who yeah. are suggesting in an analysis way that that they should trade him this summer and yeah i give the kid a chance mm -hmm. give the kid a chance i feel pulling the plug now would be and yeah he's not a he's not big but i mean he he's got skill he bulked himself up he's way mm -hmm. stronger than he he used to be and to your point if uh if faber was not such a freak because he's played so well at his age <laughs> and his his status right like i think we'd be talking a lot more about Marco, but unfortunately for him, his statistical production gets o overshadowed by Brock. But mm -hmm. yeah, if you could get, and, and you're right, Rossi has tried to shoot and he's had some ba bad luck. Um, but I just think you need to get Matt's if you're stuck with Matt's. And I would love to trade him because I do think that that you could get something back for him. But if you're stuck with Matt's, I think that you do need to put him in a role that he's not in right now. And it can't mean going back to Kirill. Mm -hmm. Like at some point in time, that door has just closed. So it well, can't be, I'm going to run back to Capri South. We're going to put you back with K Kirill. But yeah, I like that thought. And Boldy and Eric Sinek and Kirill are working. I mean, that's, that's the one right. line that's been constant. You can't do that. Like there's, they've Correct. given you too much to argue against it. So yeah, he doesn't need his security blanket. He's a grown man. He can figure this out. Let's just He's Linus. change. Yes. He's yes. Linus now. He's got the blanket with him. <laughs> Or, or he wants it back. He can't have he it, wants back. it back. Yeah, I agree. Okay, next topic. Uh, continuing down the path of the contract brothers, Marcus Foligno. So he turns 33 in August. He just, uh, his season came to an end. He underwent, the team announced this, core muscle surgery. It's the second year in a row. Uh, if you don't recall the last time, it's because he had core muscle surgery on the other core, the other side last summer. So he didn't miss, he, he missed time, but I don't think he missed time because of that surgery. Um, let's just throw out some of the facts. He scored 23 goals and 42 points in 74 games two years ago. He was absolutely brilliant. He has combined for 17 goals and 43 points. So six fewer goals and one fewer points in 120 uh, games in the two seasons since. His games played have gone from 74 to 65 to 55 and he's going to begin a four-year 16 million dollar extension next year uh he also has a no move clause that goes to a 15 team no trade list in the final two years i don't think there's anyone questioning this guy's effort i don't think there's anyone questioning he's important to the room i he he does a lot of things and jesse i know a year ago you talked about then trading him because it did make some sense at the time um but what is the concern, Jesse, now with a guy that's going to turn 33 in August, 
back-to-back surgeries on the same thing essentially which is co- which is your core which is a big deal and the decline and the fact he plays a tough game that leads to these problems what is your Felino concern about a decline not because he wants the decline but because he's just really banged up and he plays a really really heavy game my concern is Bill Guerin's love for Marcus Felino because that's where you're going to be locked in with him. I, I do. I adore Marcus. I get everything you had said, Judd, the room, all of that. And that's what will keep him around. I don't think Bill Guerin is going to entertain that idea. I think he adores Marcus Felino too much. I think the team adores too much. They lean on him. Um, you know, he's one of the very few guys on this team that does have that size, right? I mean, they're, it's a small, small team otherwise. Um, I think that helps him. Is it concerning? Yes. But again, I've always had low expectations. Even when he exceeded and had career highs, I just don't. Marcus, to me, is. Why is he so is nice great, to you? He's so nice. I know. He's so I, nice <laughs> to you, and you do nothing but try and trade him and say, I don't have high expectations. Well, I, that's just You're the like reality. the mom who's like, I, oh, that's my third kid. He ain't that smart. <laughs> I mean, you still love him, though, right? Like, I still want the best for him. But I just think I just I don't have I I don't need him to do a heck of a whole lot. Frankly, I really don't. I need him to go out there, be the size, not necessarily play the enforcer per se, which he does, but be that physical element, chip in a couple shots when he can, because he can have some pretty good shots. Like he sometimes wows me with like the beauty of his backhand. Like I'm like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. But I I didn't know he could do that because I don't expect him to do it. Like that's- Backhanded insults. It's just- Well, great shot. I'm surprised. He sucks for the most part. (laughs) I mean, he's just, he's, he, I, I don't have a problem with Marcus saying, yes, it's at $4 million a year. Um, again, I think you're going to see him be with this team, even injuries aside. It's kind of, you look at it, it's like Jared Spurgeon a little bit, right? I mean, be most intrigued to see how he comes back from his recent surgery with the injury to his hip that left him out this year. Yeah. Um, he's another aging player with, with the contract that's going to expire sooner than, than Felino's. But Marcus has Bill Guerin holding hands they're buds it's fine felino you're okay by me bud <laughs> you just oh. basically torched him <laughs> and and at the end I did said, it you're with an a okay smile guy. yeah and yeah it's which, fine which one of your three kids gets the felino treatment definitely the middle kid love him to death but he's just he says he wants to be a tow truck driver and that's fine i accept that's what i expect Works real hard. Great backhand. I'm shocked nice by kid. it sometimes. Great character <laughs> nice, player. He's, great, he's yeah. hilarious. So. Character in the room. Yep. Character yeah. in the room. That's yeah. a kid I want to drink with in like 18 years. <laughs> exactly. um, age, what's your concern about Felino? It's it, it's just your age and the injury. I mean, kind of just to really wrap up what you guys just said, it's he plays such a physical game. It's right. going to be tough to see him try to adapt because the problem with him is I don't know with his stature how you can expect him to shift to like a more finesse shifty game he's just not that's like asking you're trying to parallel park a semi truck on you know somewhere downtown on a a friday night it's just tough to do you're not going to find a spot so i just don't think moving into this new contract extension it's four years at four million a year like that's and that's not a that's not a detriment on him i'm not going to blame a player for putting pen to paper there that's on Bill Guerin for not looking ahead long enough and being like, hey, this guy's gameplay, the, the, just the way that he plays hockey for us, there's only a certain price tag you can put put on a aggressive glue guy. I think $4 is a little rich, but congrats to Felino for you know making that deal work. Um, it, it's it's going to be interesting because I feel like you're going to get two years into this and we're going to be sitting here on a, on a Wednesday in 2026 and just be like, God, I can't wait till this guy's off the books. Like, there's so much they could do with that four million dollars. And, um, and, and right now, I get it. Fans love him. You should. I think he's a great guy. He wears the A for a reason. He's respected in the locker room. He's respected around the league. And I just am concerned moving forward that the the level that he's at is going to take such a big hit because as soon as he has anything reaggravated, it's going to be so noticeable. Like, I don't. He's not a guy that can shy away from hits because right. he usually is the guy that's delivering those hits. So as soon as you take that element away of any wind singer, he has to go like 60% instead of a hundred. It's just going to be so noticeable and hindering to the team. I think two, two, but two years in, it's an easy buyout. I mean, it's not a terrible buyout for them, right? Like you'd be okay with it or, you know, healthy scratch them for a while, have them sit up in the press box and be like, Hey bud, let's move you. I think that's, it wouldn't be detrimental because you've got these, the big ones off the books by then. Yeah. Yeah. But why did you give them, 
four years. Like, why not? To, like, the, the Zuccarello contract extension of all of these is actually, okay, it's two years. So he, he played through 2023, 20, 24, and then it's two years. I sort of, I don't love that one, but I sort of get that one. I'm surprised they didn't make Marcus's two years. The same reason that you gave Alex Goligoski another year, because they love being here. You want to do a solid, that, but that's just it. We can disagree with it, but I feel like that's exactly it. Marcus loves it here, loves the community, and, and that's wonderful. Absolutely great. He has his family here. He wants to be here for the rest of his career. So Bill said, yeah, sure. All right, Billy. Go. Billy, I'm going to talk to you right now. You and me, because I like you, Billy. <laughs> There's something called personal services contracts. Marcus Foligno would be a great ambassador. Like in two years, be like, dude, if you think that you're going to be done, and if you're not, that's fine. We will sign you for two years, go back to Buffalo or something. But, <laughs> but I mean, seriously, Marcus Foligno will be in the lobby before tonight's game in 2027, shaking hands. He'll see Jesse Pierce. He'll say hi, despite the fact she torched him. Um, you know, like like I could see him suit and tie. Good looking guy. Real good looking guy. Walking around, pressing the flesh, drinking some beers with fans. I mean, he could he could be on Bally's. I mean, it doesn't take much to be super positive consistently. So put him on Bally's. Anyway, yeah, I don't get that one. I don't get that one. But Jesse, you bring up a you bring up a, a really interesting point, which I don't feel is being discussed in, enough. And that is this, because this this team actually goes against what I think Garen actually at the end of the day wants. Pat Maroon was supposed to, to help, and it didn't work. But the size of the team that's a real that's really interesting, mm -hmm. because and and like to, again back to what you said, you know, Felino can play that enforcer role, but with his body right now, you really don't want him having to like go fight the fights all the time. That's a lot of wear and tear. Um, I am really curious to see what Bill does. He's got to get some more size here. L yeah. Like I was watching that game last night. How many times did they not hit a guy? And that's mm -hmm. Ottawa. I mean, yeah, Kachuk's a pain in the ass, but you know, so you're right. Like what is going to be the resolution to try and get, get more size of guys that if not fight can certainly take the body more consistently. And, you know, God bless the fourth line. They'll do it. And Mason Shaw will uh, mix things up, but we stood by him last night. Mm -hmm. He ain't exactly the size of a guy you want to have to mix it up consistently, <laughs> and he sure as hell can't defend a teammate. Yeah, well, and he's the one that had even brought that up. He's like, our line, which is Vinny Letary, him, and uh, was it Jake Luchini, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. He's like, we're not towering over anybody because those those are the three smallest guys on the team. Marat isn't very big. I forgot that he's quite a bit smaller. Um, Riley Height has some size to him. I think he's listed at 6'2", so that'll be really good for when they kick him up into the big leagues. Uh, Danilia Yurov needs to put on some weight, but otherwise I think he's got some good height to him. Charlie Stremel, I know that's a hot-button topic for a lot of folks, but he's huge. He's a big, big dude. In the portal. In the portal. Yeah, well, that's no surprise. He well, needs to go somewhere where they'll play him. Hastings I know he does. Hastings having none of it. Hastings screwed him. Hastings, eesh, tough go. Although that makes you wonder what Charlie Strammel's really all about. I mean, time will tell there as well. Oh, that pick's looking terrible. Let's it's let's not let's not even pretend it's homegrown. Not. But that's about all. But yeah, I mean, I mean he's yeah. yeah. You got to get somebody that can be more physical. I mean, Jewel Eric said you don't want Kirill Kaprizov being the physical presence on your team, and Kirill will. He'll go in there and mix it up, but you can't risk and, and afford that. So it's something that I'm sure, because Bill likes his big guys. He's yeah. tried numerous times to go in and get some big bodies, right? You got to look at Oscar Sundquist a couple of years ago, too. I mean, he'll go out there and do it, um, but it's something that's going to definitely need to be addressed even more so before next year. And I'd like a veteran guy, or veteran guys, too. Like, like it's great to bring up youth that's big kids but i mean they don't necessarily step in and play that that role like i'm talking about like i'm talking about a pat maroon that can still play a little bit more mm -hmm. and and can play that style because because you you know if you're going to ask felino to basically be the enforcer or a common day in enforcer um that's a really big ask for a guy who i think is breaking down to a certain degree so yeah that's a and, and the other thing i would love and bill has not done this yet and i think you have to and eventually guys will probably start to c come up, but big defensemen. Like yeah. you look at those, you look, you, if you get those bleep kicking defensemen, that's how you win a Stanley cup. I mean, mm -hmm. God bless Spurge, but he's so small and now he's hurt and now he's been hurt. 
And I mean, Brodeen's not a, like a real small guy, but he's not a bit, you know, like, like I feel like they've he's got like some... a little Bambi. Like, did you see him last <laughs> night? Like, he's just a doe eyed little sweetheart. Did you, that just <laughs> did you see what I think precipitated the, the end of the game thing with Kachuk? There was Kachuk about... hit him and then Brode slashed Kachuk back. And so well, then Kachuk jumped, right? With eight minutes or so left in the third at the blue line, they, they met at the wild blue line. I think it was slightly away from the puck. And Kachuk, like, took his stick and, like, jabbed Broads, and Broads jabbed him back. And it was it was all stick work. It was ugly. And mm -hmm. then they they met up again, and that took place. But, I mean, Brodeen's not going to... Brodeen's not going to take a guy and destroy him. You know, I want guys, like, the perfect e example, Vegas, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they got some of those big... The Blues team that won a cup had the same thing. You need those big guys, and it just feels like now especially... This team is way too small. And for a Bill Guerin team, it's really too small. So, right. Let's go to a feel good story hmm. because that's right. You know, I love feel good stories. The Mason Shaw story, okay? So, April 1st of 2023, for the fourth time in this kid's life, he tears an ACL. Right ACL. He's torn the left twice in his career, he's torn the right twice. It looked like that was it. Like he had rehabbed from three ACL tears. And I mean, he is a fourth line guy. So this is not a guy that a team would say, we got to get him back. Rehabs, I think without a contract, the wild took care of him, but they didn't sign him. I think, right, Jess. Mm -hmm. And then they eventually sign him. He goes to play at Iowa comes up. I think he played his 13th game with the wild yesterday, which by the way, in itself is a great story that, that he even got back here. Forget this. But then a year and a day to the date of when he tore the ACL in Vegas, he scores a goal. This is why sports is cool. And in talking to him last night, you could tell he deeply appreciated it. But man, hat tip to a kid that does not give up. Yeah, I mean, Mason Shaw is a tremendous human being. He's always held his head high, even in the conversations when he after he tore his ACL. I mean, he knew immediately. When you've been through that three times, you know instantly what the problem was. And he certainly did that night uh, when they played Vegas, and it happened last year. But he's worked hard, and, and he always credited Bill Guerin for giving him the opportunity for continuing to believe in him. And I do think that's really cool. That's not something Bill Guerin had to do or the Wild organization had to do, and they really stood by him. It's reminiscent of... Uh, Jack O'Callaghan, right? You know, the kid's giving me everything he's got. I'm supposed to cut him? No, you don't do that. He took a page out of Herb <laughs> oh, Brooks' book. Miracle, you know? man. I'm miracle. Tearing up. I'm um, tearing, I'm tearing up. I know. But, and I mean, he's a farm kid. Mason Shaw is a bona fide farm kid. He comes from that. So he has that work ethic. He has all of those good things instilled in him. And that's just further proof. He's an RFA after this year. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. But I think he's also, it's not just a sweet, here, we're feeling bad for you type of thing. This kid works his butt off and he's earned this opportunity beyond just giving it to him. It's not something that it's like, we feel bad for you. Here you right. go, buddy. Here's a lollipop. I mean, right. he certainly can contribute. Um, he's he's good in the locker room. He's one of the another one of those guys that I think they really appreciate. He's got his own little clique of guys, the younger generation in there too, which I think is cool. And I'd be interested to see him continue to show what he's got, not only in the rest of the season, but come training camp next year and, and really show everybody what kind of player he is. I think he's a solid fourth liner for sure. I like having him down there. He's got the physical presence and he can put him away. Zach Bogosian, shout out to him though. That was served up on a platter. I think Where Shaw said, I owe him dinner because that was so <laughs> Where pretty. did that come from? Yeah. Gorgeous. From Bogosian. It was great. That's We're why feet. the Thrashers took him what? Second overall in that draft or something like that? Yeah. 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 Did you see that pass, AJ? So good. Yeah, that was They're ridiculous. Sauced. I thought it was Kale so McCarr for a second. Look, look, really good. <laughs> it did. It, it, it seriously looked like a great pass. In fact, it, it looked like a pass that could have come from Brock Faber. And my favorite thing from last night had nothing to do with the game. It had to do with the post-game locker room age. When so so Bogosian was the first guy to to talk, and the locker room op operates as such. Nobody players do not sit in there unless they're scheduled to talk to us. So they go in the back. But Brock is very good about his obligations with us. So he sat at his stall. He was going to wait for Bogosian to get done talking. But our colleague, Jesse Pierce, decided to go right to uh, uh, Brock because, you know, she, she had the ability to start talking to him to expedite the process. But she wasn't expediting the process at all. In fact, she wasn't even talking about the game. 
you got into a serious debate with Faber about which one of you could do a better job, what, drawing the wild insignia without yeah. <laughs> looking at it? Now, yeah, did, in 20 seconds. In 20 seconds, because he did that for, or a bunch of players did that for the website, and then you said his sucked. Take the yes. story from there. The, this, is the, this is the story, because the team, it's done. We're done, right? We're cooked. I'm, I'm okay with it. Let's have some fun. I really try to get to know the players, chirp them a little bit, have them not hate me so much. Uh, so I went into Brock during morning skate yesterday, and I said, hey, bud, got a problem with your logo. And he's like, what? Mine was the best out of all of them. He was genuinely serious. He's like, everybody else has sucked. Mine was the best. And I was like, it wasn't. I thought it was the worst. He's grown up around this logo. He should have had the heads up on that in general. So he was like, all right, can you do better? 20 seconds, can you do better? And I said, absolutely, I can. So I don't know if you guys can see this. Um, let's see if let's we can see. tap it. Oh, that's that's not it. Nope. I don't need to be scrolling. Um, you can follow me on Twitter to find it. I can Apparently totally it, people yeah. think it looks like a dinosaur skull head, which maybe if you yeah. look at it, Brock's criticisms of it were that I had this, the moon too circular and too much in the mid at the end, whatever, but so we it's had supposed a very to good look like this. It's supposed to look like that. It yeah, is, which is hard. It's, yeah. it's very difficult. I think that yep. would work. There we go. Oh yeah. That's it. Oh yeah. yeah, that looks like something That's, from the Flintstones. It looks like, it's, a, like a clearly, drawing by the Flintstones. It's clearly a bear. And it's clearly got the river. It was it, 20 <laughs> seconds. And he's like, and you didn't have anybody chirping you with questions before you drew it, too. So he was very passionate about this, as was I. Because I also have a competitive streak within me that I like to be better. I, did, I just don't think it's that bad. I think it's... I, I did it a couple times in the press box, too, just to see. And I'm like, no, it still looks the same. I am very good at drawing Yoshi heads, I think. <laughs> that, well, but what's funny is, one is, I do think that his was the best among his teammates, because I thought... No. I, I no. thought there were some terrible ones. Really? But the other great part is, Age, I'm not joking, this this discussion turned like spirited. Like, <laughs> Fa Faber had just played in a National Hockey League game, and I thought he'd be joking around about it. He was dead serious. He was very offended. And, and what's funny is when you did start to talk to him about the game, he snapped like in the sense that he turned on the cliche. Mm -hmm. So like, like when he's talking to Jesse as a human and a competitor, like he's really spirited in his voice inflection. Oh, the kid's funny as hell too. And he's, then when you started funny. to talk about the game, he was fine, but you could, his tone totally changed. Yeah, we went out, played, competed hard, puck steep, all of that stuff. <laughs> it was the funniest thing because mm -hmm. for a moment he was actually acting very real like he would with his buddies or something. <laughs> we he, agreed he that is... mine is better than Midzi's. Okay, that's what we've come to. Oh, our God, agreement was oh, both yeah. of ours far His was succeeded. terrible. Midzi's was terrible. Yeah. Middleton's yeah. was well, awful. I'm looking at it again here. His looks like like a like a clown almost. Can, yeah. can you put it up to the screen? I, I can't. Let's see if I can do this here. Oh, whoops. For, for those of us watching it. Oh yeah. So so his is the bottom. Oh, you're yeah, right. You oh, you know it. what? I'm wrong. It's, it's so terrible. bad. It looks okay, like a desert not... scene. I was looking at somebody else's. Kaprizov's is pretty good, and so is Boldy's. I thought Boldy's. Boldy's. What's I thought Boldy's was the best out of it. What's yeah. Middleton's? You know what? I it's must have been thinking of Bold Boldy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Middleton. <laughs> Middleton's <laughs> looks like uh looks like a whale. Yeah. With people inside of it. It's. Very bizarre. I mean, the only okay. thing that yeah, Brock right. had, Faber's Brock had awful. the coloring, right? Like, I like that he was able to get the yellow in there. But are those cactuses? Right? Yeah, and it's it just a like... triangle? Yeah, yours is better. No question okay. about it. Absolutely. Boldy's might be as good as yours, I think. Yeah. But, yeah. okay, yeah, no, I was wrong. For some reason, I thought Boldy's was Faber's. Well, just wait, just for, for comparison's sake, for it's all of like our viewing Arizona audience. more like Arizona Coyotes thing. Oh, yeah. Right? There, there we go. There, there you go. Please cast your votes in the comments. Yeah, below. you know what? I'm going bold. Yeah, if if you uh, want to comment, I'm going boldy first. I think I go Jesse or Kaprizov second, and then yeah, those, those I, last two are awful. I I, th I think what, boldy, what's your vote, Cage? Boldy, Kaprizov, Jesse. Jesse's a close right behind Kaprizov. Yeah, but then it's and then Middleton's just so bad. It's so so bad. how did Brock so, seriously I'll, defend that? I'm telling you, he was, he, he. No, just, I know he did. Yeah. He was very, he was, he was really sort of offended. Like he was, he was competitively trying to tell you that it was good. Yeah. It, it seriously looks like a desert. 
It does. It because it looks like yeah. cactuses. It makes no sense. And like I said, I only chirped him for it because I was like, "You grew up. You've seen this." Because the whole point was they were doing it without looking at it, right? Where right. I know Kaprizov did sneak a peek. Somebody was wearing the shirt. He said when he was doing it. Yeah. But that's where I was like, you know what? You've seen this logo in and out as often as I have. You, you're better than this, Brock. I demand better from him. And uh, it turned into a very fun side conversation because again, he's he's funny and, and he's fun to chirp. Like he's very funny. He does get very he invested. He in did betting himself. <laughs> he did. All right, guys. Well, again, if you want to uh, go to our comment section and you can vote for uh, Boldy, for Kaprizov, <laughs> Middleton, uh, Jesse Pierce, whomever you think, tell us who you think did the best job. With a logo that we all agree probably wasn't the smartest choice to begin with. But that's a whole nother story on Judd's Hockey Show. <laughs> Check out Jess at, uh, of course, with her podcast with uh, Kirsten Cole at uh, Bar Down Beauties and also NHL.com. Check out her uh, day-to-day beat coverage on the wild. He's AJ. I'm Judd. We'll talk to you later.